Peter Dingate Thrush, you served as chairman of the board from 2007 to 2011 during the Bush and Obama administrations. How would you characterize the relationship between ICANN and the U.S. government during that period? I think ICANN's always done very well by having the relationship that it's had with the U.S. government. And I've often uh, said this uh, to others and thought about it. If, if ICANN had been set up or if the Internet had been invented in any other country, uh, one can imagine there would have been a very difficult relationship with the government. But in fact, um, being in the United States in general, with the um, laws that are available, uh, and the government has actually, I think, been a good thing for ICANN. Interested in your thoughts, in, in it, to that point, it would have been easy, it strikes me, everybody is aware that the Internet sort of arose from U.S. government research. It would have been very easy for the U.S. government, the USG, to say, okay, we're st throughout this development of this thing called the Internet, we're <coughs> going to preserve control over the domain name system, the DNS. They didn't. They went out of their way to say, we want to transition this to the private sector. Why do you think that is? I think you have to go back even earlier uh, because there was, first of all, no such thing as a domain name system when the internet first mm -hmm. started. And so we had packet switching programs working for quite a long time before uh, Mr. Mocha Petrus gave us the domain name system. Mm -hmm. And so uh, you wouldn't have, you couldn't have made the split in, in that way. And the other thing to remember, I guess, is that there were many alternatives to the internet being tested and tried, uh, including at a very high level. The International Telecommunications Union and other governments were pushing a completely different set of protocols than what eventually became the internet. Um, so uh, I, I think we, we are lucky that the, first of all, the approach that the inventors took, as well as the US government that mostly employed them, was that this was, probably because they didn't realize how successful it was going to be, but also because there was a pattern of, if you like, openness about that sort of technology that it was mm -hmm. going to be made available for, for the community, for industry to use. Uh, and as a result, we've done, I think, very well out of it. You said that we're kind of fortunate that the Internet was invented in the U.S. Um, in response to my first question. Elaborate on that for me. Well, of course, the whole internet wasn't invented in the US, but some of the key technology, uh, Vint and Bob Kahn doing the uh, TCP IP protocols, right. probably the key, the key bit. Uh, but, the, but there are other building blocks before them, a lot of it done in the US. I think the reason why it's useful that it was in the US was because, first of all, it's, uh, you know, uh, this is not just my own ba bias being an English speaker, but I think speaking, coming from an English speaking background meant that it was widespread adoption uh, was assisted. I think coming from a country which had um, reasonably strong laws, strong enforcement of law, uh, strong observance of the rule of law, uh, all meant that people were confident in building institutions and, and trusting to contracts, for example, which can, is how we control most of the behavior, et cetera, on the internet, around, on the domain name system, were all controlled by the contracts. So having a, having a jurisdiction that understood contracts uh, and where they could be enforced, I think made a big difference. It was during your tenure that the JPA, the Joint Project Agreement, <coughs> was replaced or uh, succeeded by the affirmation of commitments. First of all, explain to me what the JPA was, mm. and secondly, why this succession was important. <coughs> well, actually, yes, I, I think the ending of the JPA was probably the most significant thing that uh, of my term. And a lot of other things happened in that time. A lot of people are, can't give me credit for uh, working on IDNs or uh, restructuring ICANN or, or the new GTLD program. But in fact, I think the, one of the most significant steps was that transition. Um, so you need to understand, I think when we started, there were three, there were th three major agreements that, that I ICANN was involved in. Uh, and the first one was the IANA contract, actually managing the database that tells the internet domain name system and the IP addressing system where things are. So that was quite important. Uh, the other one was when the US government wanted to encourage the internet community to build a structure that in the end became ICANN, uh, when ICANN emerged uh, one of several proposals as to how to carry out the principles of the white paper and the green paper, um, there was a memorandum of understanding signed between the US government and <coughs> this new body called ICANN which basically said look, if you do all these things, we will transition control of this IANA system to this body. But, but you've got to prove yourselves. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and, you know, we were a startup starting from scratch. Uh, and so the joint project agreement was originally the, the memorandum of understanding. 
And what that required ICANN to do was build safe and stable relationships with all of the key players in the internet infrastructure. And it started off having relationships with almost none of them. And through a variety of uh, political, diplomatic, contractual, uh, and cooperative sort of moves, ICANN has become the place where, for example, in my background in the, in the CCTLDs, the CCTLDs signed up and said, yes, we want an organization where we can come and talk about the interconnectivity issues. <coughs> We'll talk about our issues at home, but we mm -hmm. need a global place to come. Uh, when the monopoly in relation to the generic names was being broken up, originally there was only one registrar. You had mm -hmm. to buy all .com, net, and org names from one, one store. And so one of our first exercises was to bring some competition to that. That required a setting up a stable contract that registrars could sign up to, and then rules that allowed them to access the registries. So, each of these was a massive sort of exercise, creating the concept of registrars and then creating the framework for them to exist and then bringing, out, bringing them into ICANN. So the MOU said, you need to do all these things. Mm -hmm. And once you've got all these things in place and you've got a safe and stable structure, we will transition the IANA function to you mm -hmm. because you will be, you'll be ready. Mm -hmm. So much of my time at ICANN was spent trying to live up to that obligation, create an ICANN that was doing all the things that an ICANN should do. Mm -hmm. and was trusted by the rest of the community to do them. And so I, when I was chair, I reached the conclusion with support from the board that we had got to that point. We didn't get there quickly or easily, but the uh, memorandum of understanding, which had transitioned itself by this stage to the joint project agreement, was coming to an end. And we said, well, let's see whether or not we can make that the end. It was originally only supposed to last for two years, and by now it was sort of seven or eight years, nine years old. I thought, and I think the board thought, that we had actually completed the obligations of the original MOU. And so the first thing we did was put to, together the, uh, a previous committee set up by the CEO, the President's Strategy Committee, and we repurposed that, got in some new people, and set about on a project that was actually helped triggered or named by Meredith Atwell Baker, who was the, one of the, 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 the chief contact at the US government that we mm -hmm. were dealing with at NTIA. So she had written uh, us a letter because we'd had some preliminary conversations about ending that particular relationship. Uh, and in the course of that letter, she said that what ICANN needed to do was improve its institutional confidence. Mm -hmm. And so we gave that to the President's Strategy Committee and said, what do we do to improve institutional confidence in ICANN? And that committee then went all around the world, interviewed community members, outside people. We had a um, number of high profile meetings and asked the community, what do you think is wrong with ICANN? How do we improve it? And what, mm -hmm. are, what are particularly the things that will give you confidence that ICANN can stand alone without this particular relationship with the US government? Mm -hmm. It was very important because under the joint project agreement, ICANN was effectively subject to a lot of Department of Commerce control. Mm -hmm. um, it's well, a let very, me interrupt for just a second. Was that control ever exercised? Yes, it was. Uh, in, a, in an administrative kind of way, what it provided was a series of uh, targets that ICANN had to keep meeting. Mm -hmm. you, you, uh, I mentioned a couple of contracts with the CCTLDs, contracts with the uh, address organisations, relationships with business, relationships with government. So all of these things had to be done. But the key requirement was that uh, the Department of Commerce would, would frequent, first of all, there was a regular reporting requirement. So there was a master servant relationship set up in that structure, uh, which we started to feel was no longer appropriate. and the need to uh, change all that. So that was how it was exercised. And the, probably the most galling, if you like, or the most obvious feature of this control was, um, well, there are two aspects. First of all, if, when the Department of Commerce was required to give testimony in Senate or House hearings, the US government itself in those institutions made it quite clear that the Department of Commerce had the power to go and do things and tell ICANN what to do. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Remember, ICANN is positioning itself as the administrative and coordinating body for the internet for the world. And so this particular relationship with the US government was becoming difficult to sell. Uh, or to maintain. sell internationally. To sell internationally, yes. Um, as I say, what we're trying to do is build the institutional confidence mm -hmm. of ICANN to, in the world, that the, the world is going to trust ICANN to manage all these particular things, set up these contracts and run them fairly. Uh, and so that kind of obvious influence on television mm 
where the uh, Senate or the American are doing political hearings. organment having hearings, telling the Department of Commerce what to get ICANN to do. So let me ask you this, Peter. Did and I understand that? I understand that you, you've got the U.S. government over here telling the Hill, Capitol Hill, we've got final say on this, mm. we've got control on this, and at the same time that you're trying to sell the independence of the organization internationally. Did the USG, did the US government know or care about your difficulties in selling ICANN's independence <coughs> internationally? Um, Was it ever a point of discussion? I, I think so, but only in, 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 if you think of the sort of concentric circles of, of influence and knowledge mm -hmm. that surround anything. The, the NTIA officials were very much aware of that. Mm -hmm. And they were being subjected to it because uh, particularly US business who wanted a particular result on the internet in relation to the domain name system would come and lobby them. For example, you know, trademark lobbyists who wanted the rules relating to trademark infringement and domain name and, and things. And we had a lot of problems with cyber squatters and so forth. Instead of going through an ICANN process to achieve their results, or sometimes having gone through an ICANN process and not being happy with the result, they would then go and lobby the Department of Commerce and say, well, look, you're controlling these guys. You tell them to do this. And so the Department of Commerce were very aware of this. And, and the next layer out at state, when and I had this happen as well, sitting next to uh, heads of state and some ministers from other countries, we would be abused for sometimes quite long periods over a formal dinner uh, by foreign officials saying, why has the US government got its hands in this process? Uh, and the particular sticking point, which I guess we've come to, <coughs> uh, was actually a very small thing, but you know, in diplomacy with national symbols, some of these things have a high degree of um, friction and create a lot more heat than that. Than, 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 and, and one of those was the management of the CCTLD. Uh, so you've got countries have what they regard as their own place on the internet, say for New Zealand it's .nz, for France it's .fr, Brazil has .br, and, and these are large in entities and they've built up a lot of, a lot of um, you know, registrations and that's how the internet is run in those particular countries. But any changes to that used to have to require the approval of a relatively low level Department of Commerce staff person. And so it looked from the outside as if the national internet system in Brazil or France or New Zealand or any other country was actually at the end of the day subject to US government control. Mm -hmm. And so the signaling was much worse than the reality. The, the interesting thing here is during the IANA stewardship transition, the argument was made repeatedly by ICANN that <coughs> look, it's, it's hard for us to say that all governments have equal say when the US government actually has this function. Mm. You seem to be validating that <coughs> from quite a ways back. Oh, certainly. It's certainly a very real problem. But let, let's finish the, the JPA point, because that, that was like, there's, there's a two-step process here. The first is the ending the joint project agreement, which was ICANN's agreement with the Department of Commerce. Mm -hmm. And so we had this process where we said, we think we've finished. We think we've done all the things that are in the JPA. We went around the world and had the President's Strategy Committee ask everybody. And the issues that they raised were capture. They don't want the system able to be taken over. Uh, and a very number of other things. So the, we, we thought we, we could perform those. Then we had a period living up to, to that. And at the when the time came, we said, no, we are not going to sign an extension of that. So then we went into negotiations, uh, and it was at the Sydney meeting in 2009, where we had the session with the Department of Commerce and said, look, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to go sit in this master-servant relationship. We're not going to be reporting to you. And I, I didn't mention the other thing. I mentioned the Senate and the other hearings. Mm -hmm. The Department of Commerce itself used to say, we're going to have a hearing into how good ICANN is or not. And we wanted that to stop. We didn't want ICANN's performance to be being reviewed mm -hmm. against a set of criteria created by the US government, by the US government. And so the brilliance of the affirmation of commitments was that all that stopped. And what the affirmation of commitments said was, the community is going to was, review ICANN, so not when, the US government. When you were having this conversation with Commerce and you're going, okay, we want this to stop, we, and you were advancing what later became the AOC, or conceptually the AOC, what came back at you from Commerce, from the US government? Um, mostly very helpful, and this is another reason why... They weren't resistant to the idea. They wanted to do the right thing, and I give them a lot of credit always. And it was never... Uh, we, we had different views, but it was never adversarial. Um, and it was always... This was the original plan. Can we do it? Um, I have to say, earlier administrations that I dealt, that I dealt with were, um, and, and possibly rightly so, were of the view that ICANN was not ready in their term. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking back two or three years before, um, 
the 2009 meeting when we started raising these conversations. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, ICANN probably had a lot of work to do, but as I say, we thought by 2009 we'd, we got to the point where we no longer needed to report to the Department of Commerce and the Department of Commerce should not be having hearings reviewing ICANN's progress uh, and maintaining this sort of control. So the AOC, uh, the ending of the JPA in creating the AOC was a major milestone of ICANN saying, we're gonna stand on our own now. We're gonna be subject to full review, but it's gonna be reviewed by the entire community against a whole series of targets. And the Department of Commerce is gonna have a role in doing that review as part of the community. Mm -hmm. And that's what set the scene then for the second one, which was the transition of the, uh, uh, the end of the bargain. If ICANN gets itself into be a major global, safe, stable manager repository for these internet functions, then the last thing to go would be the IANA functions coming into ICANN. How did the affirmation of commitments, both conceptually before they were drawn and when they were signed, go over on Capitol Hill? Well, you'd have to ask them. I, 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 I'm I think sure you heard that. I, I think, I don't think everybody understood it quite, quite frankly, but I think it was sufficiently clear that first of all, the Department of Commerce had a, had a continuing role in that process. And that was, I think, was one of their worries. Is there a link? Can, mm -hmm. do, we, do we have a, you know, a way into this process? Because it's relatively arcane. Um, and is it, uh, what are the goals and what are the principles? And they are, I think, principles that could be relatively easily explained and sold in a political process. They're about openness, they're about transparency, they're about accountability, responsibility. So I think in the end, it was a little bit of explaining and not a hard, but not a hard sell. The, the, the main takeaway I'm getting, what I'm hearing you say, is while ICANN may have advanced an, the, the concept of an AOC, Commerce certainly wasn't resistant. I mean, they were they were receptive to the idea and actually collaborated in moving it forward. Well, it was is a, that a correct interpretation? Absolutely. The, the the idea of the AOC came out of a particular set of conversations with them, and we can, we go back now and can't quite remember who actually right. said, said what at the time. But it was clear we wanted to end a process where the Department of Commerce was investigating and managing and reporting on ICANN to some process there where the community was doing it, and so that's what the that's that was the the shift. The Department of Commerce didn't want, didn't want to be able to suddenly have no relationship, to have none of these things that were there before, and neither did we. But it was, it was, so in other words, it was the Department of Commerce moving out of the role where it did these things and creating a structure where the community did them. And that, mm -hmm. was, that was the psychological and, and political and important um, shift. When you think back about your tenure as chair, you've already said that, that the AOC, this transition from the JPA, to the succeeding AOC was a major point in terms of defining the USG's relationship with ICANN. Yes. Were there other points during your tenure? We had input from, from the USG in a number of ways through, through the GAC on, on issues, but we also had other conversations. Um, it, I'm just, I, I suppose the obvious one is Triple X, where mm -hmm. they, were, were one of the early applications under these very limited rounds for a new top level domain. Um, but it was before the new G program actually began, right? Well before, yeah. yes. Th this, was, this was one of the old, remember there were two small rounds uh, of new GTLDs. Part of the ICANN DNA was to come up with a process for new GTLDs. Right. The first one was, uh, uh, we added seven, and then the second round, um, there was the idea of these sponsored, if there could be a community that had its own particular right. TLD, they, that community could sponsor, so they're called sponsored TLDs, and the triple X one I think came out of that where there was a, people thought the adult content industry could be defined and could have a, a place on the internet for adult content. Now, pornography is legal in, in many countries, uh, but it still created a, a huge amount of excitement from people who are opposed to adult content. Um, and so it, there are some strong lobbyists in this country and in the United States and they put a lot of pressure on their congressmen and their thing to, to try and go back down that control route that we talked about and put pressure on the Department of Commerce to put pressure on ICANN. To, to block it. To block it. And I have to say, and I was... And what form did that pressure take? Well, I was, I was never, a, uh, as a board member through that process, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and as a, uh, eventually as chair, I was never aware of, okay. any, of any process. There have been accusations by, by people, uh, and you know, there was a, quite a major case, the, the case went to, before a tribunal, uh, eventually found that, that ICANN should have granted it in the first place and sent it back for reconsideration, and the board did grant it. And 
so I know as a result of that, that there were allegations made that there was pressure put on individual, uh, so I, I'm unaware of any okay. of that. Uh, and to me, it was always a relatively straightforward, have they, as far as this applicant is concerned, has it met the conditions? And I was one of a minority on the board who thought that the applicant had met the conditions and was ready to let them go. Um, so uh, the, the issue for us was that we had a, we had a meeting uh, just before the final vote to actually admit X at the San Francisco meeting, and we, uh, we had a visit from the Assistant Secretary of the Department of Commerce, Larry Strickling, with whom we have a very good relationship, and he said he wanted to talk to, our, talk to the senior leadership about, about this decision that was coming up. Uh, and so we convened a meeting th that morning. Uh, I, from memory, it was um, um, my vice chair, uh, the CEO, and legal counsel met mm -hmm. with Larry Strickling. And I don't want to characterize that, that as other than a discussion. Mm -hmm. um, certainly the Department of Commerce didn't say that we should do anything or not do anything. There were some questions asked about, uh, about about our processes and whether we'd thought through uh, what, what might happen with the consequences of a decision going either way. And we said that we had and the meeting came to an end. So, But was the mere presence of the Assistant Secretary in itself, it w was his mere presence in saying, proceed with caution on this, was that in itself a form of light pressure or interest or uh, was it meant to influence? It, it may have been, but it was it was a part of the many many submissions that we w we were receiving. If you like, it was perhaps the last one, and it was um, not everybody would have had quite that access to the key decision makers. Uh, it wasn't to the whole board. Um, so, but then we have a very we had a very long and healthy working relationship with the Department of Commerce. So it was it was not unusual to have. Sure. Um, uh, you know, a special, you know, a more special meeting with their representatives, say, than say another government. But, but it was, it was different. It would have been harder for the, um, for another government to have, to have had that meeting at that time. Throughout the process of of, of ICANN's uh, genesis, its 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 alteration, uh, the maturation of ICANN is often mentioned in relationship specifically to the IANA transition. Um, the U.S. government testified on the Hill and said repeatedly, you know, we waited until ICANN was mature. Well, we wanted it to be mature enough. It was a maturation process. I'm wondering what that sort of verbiage uttered by the DOC, the Department of Commerce, meant to the hierarchy of ICANN. Was there a sense in ICANN of resentment that they're saying that we're already mature? Mm. Or was there an acknowledgement, yeah, we've got a ways to go? Well, you have to understand, I, I was off the board by the time yeah. that actually happened. Yeah. Um, but at any point, I mean, uh, it, it was still an issue during your tenure, yes. maturation, right? Yes. Um, I, I think the most important signal that, that I can recall, or that I certainly encouraged, was that after the signing of the Affirmation of Commitments, we no longer heard anyone talk about the ICANN experiment. For a long time, all through those early years, it was the ICANN experiment. Interesting. It's the first global, multi-stakeholder body. It's the first body ever of its kind to take control and manage and coordinate this incredible, what's turned out to be the most, you know, the operating system for the planet. It's never been done before, and it was always regarded with some concern. It's the only place where governments don't have a dominant role, they have a, an equal role in providing input to the policies. It's not controlled by trademark owners or business constituencies. So the genius of ICANN was creating the structure that took all these forces, many of them great disparities of power. Governments have a great deal more power than a CCTLD operator or a great deal more power than a single trademark owner or a woman who's being stalked and wants protection, etc. So there's a huge variety of issues. And what I think we've done well at ICANN, it can always be improved, is we've got the power structure right. So those forces are, are held in a reasonably useful way to produce useful results. Clearly, the, the IANA stewardship transition happened after you left the board, but you're still a member of the ICANN community. How would you define the most challenging elements of that transition? Well, there's a number of aspects. The, f the first thing was, um, again, this concept of accountability and responsibility, which we embedded in the most important of the re first of the reviews under the AOC, <clears throat> that there had to be a, whoever was running this thing, 
or, or managing, coordinating, you know, we use different verbs, uh, whoever was performing these functions had to have the trust of the community. They had to be accountable, they had to have transparency where transparency is needed, and there had to be methods of redress for people who'd been, or thought they'd been, uh, you know, damaged in the process. So it was another exercise that we started with the President's Strategy Committee. It was the result of the accountability and review teams, by which time there'd been two of these going through and saying, well, how is ICANN accountable and to whom is it account accountable? So there was a sense that this was probably the last chance to really focus. Once the transition has occurred, people thought it was going to be much harder to shift views at ICANN about accountability. I, d I don't agree with it. I, s I don't agree with some of the black and white Mm -hmm. conversations that went on. This is the only chance we'll ever have to improve ICANN. I, I, think right. it was, I think it was a major chance and people were right to take advantage of it, but ICANN will continue to improve. There are continuing to be accountability mechanisms and all these things will, I think, keep growing. Um, so getting the accountability and the transparency of process and redress for grievances, etc., getting those right was important. And then proving that they could handle the technical structure and then having an escape route. If something, if all of this work uh, doesn't work, what's plan B? And I think those were the issues that the community grappled with, and I think in the end came up with quite good solutions. Let me ask you this, it was, it's, it's been stated many times that that transition fully to the private sector was envisioned to occur within a couple of years. Yes. It took much longer than that. Yes. Why? Well, partly because it, it got, every year it got bigger. Every year the, the, the internet was just growing at an enormous speed. I think um, when, when we started this idea, you know, I was involved from 1998 onwards, there were very, many fewer people on the internet. There was not, as a, you know, so what was happening as, in, as ICANN was growing and, and trying to become the body to manage these things, the size of the job was getting exponentially bigger every day. Um, so that's one thing. And it I, sounds like you're saying almost the goals were being moved. I, I think they were the same goals manage these things, get them right, do them, but the, the number of people and the players and the scale was, was going up. The, the, um, the targets were the same, but the, there was just more of it. So that, I think that's one thing. The other thing was, um, and you, you get different views about this, there are people who had vested interests in the status quo, and change is always difficult. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's people with an interest who are fighting to keep it, but there's also the inertia of people who don't really understand and don't care and you have to move them, uh, there's, there was no real opposition to it. Mm -hmm. It was just getting it, getting it right. There was opposition to it on the Hill, even in its final days, I mean. Uh, Sorry, when you say opposition to it, I, I mean sort of ICANN the concept. Ah, forgive rather me, than the, forgive me, as opposed to the transition. transition itself, yes. But by extension, that mm -hmm. was at play with the IANA stewardship transition, yep. and it came out in the testimony and the verbiage on Capitol Hill. What was your reaction at that point? I think it's the same. Um, well, first of all, there's a lot of misunderstanding about, about what it was all about, right. and, and there were a number of politicians who, being politicians, tried to take advantage for political purposes, and in the course of that said some things that really suited perhaps their audience rather than had much grounding in, in sort of technical internet sort of structures or, or, or relationships. So you, it's good to put some of that aside, I think. <clears throat> but uh, un, uh, other than that, there was a misunderstanding, I think a general misunderstanding, that somehow uh, the US government had some really powerful control over the internet. And, and it doesn't, it didn't. Mm -hmm. Uh, if it had, the internet would have grown very differently, it would have grown somewhere else, because the reason why it's grown so well is because it hasn't had that kind of central top-down control. Mm -hmm. The ability to innovate at the edge and for people to add things without permission, permissionless innovation, has been why it's been successful. But there was still some sense from people who didn't understand that uh, it must be like another company or another technology where somebody owns it and can control it. Um, so. I think a lot of the exercise was just getting through to that, that look, what we're talking about is, is the last of a relatively low-level technical function. It's mm -hmm. important, mm -hmm. uh, and somebody has to do it. But look, these guys have actually been doing it for the last 15 years. Right. They've done it without, without a problem. Um, why don't we let them sort of carry on doing it? And I think once people got over that, uh, it, was, it was a lot easier. I, I'm wondering, as a citizen, as a, 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 not a US citizen, but as a citizen of New Zealand, did that give you a lens that was beneficial? Obviously it was different, but was it perhaps beneficial or maybe irrelevant in viewing ICANN's relationship with the US government? 
I think it probably did. I, I, I think, first of all, New Zealanders have a very robust view about the government. It's very clear in New Zealand to New Zealanders that the government works for New Zealanders. Mm -hmm. um, we, and we tend to have a view that that government is best which governs least. Um, we want the government to do things that we specify. So we come, I think, with a relatively say, robust view to, to government and, and keeping government in check, uh, but using governments where it's helpful. Um, and so we tend to approach this problem in the same kind of a way. Uh, and I think the other thing was the US, to people living in the US, the US is so, is so huge, there's so much going on. There's a tendency or there's no need to actually look outside the United States to find out how other people are solving often similar problems. So I think there was a little bit of being able to come in from the outside slightly and say, look, just because this has grown up this way, just because it's been done that way, doesn't mean to say we have to keep doing it. And let's, mm. let's try this new um, global multi-stakeholder body instead, instead of a government department controlling a corporation. Let's try and open it up yeah. uh, to, to the world. And if it doesn't work, we can do something else. And I think that's the other thing about New Zealand. Being so small, we've always been ready to try things because if it doesn't work, it's easier to pivot. It, it's easier to pivot. Peter, is there anything else that we've not touched on that you think is particularly relevant when we discuss ICANN's historic relationship with the U.S. government? Um, I, th I think it's probably good to close off on the point that all of the accountability and trans uh, transparency kind of issues that were in the AOC have survived and have migrated now into the bylaws. And so what's happened, uh, because there's enormous issue that this might be the last chance, let's get it right. Uh, I, <clears throat> I was criticised because I, I saw the AOC as a temporary uh, device for getting t to this point uh, and, and said so at a meeting of the European uh, Parliament at some stage, uh, Committee of the European Parliament. And people thought, does that mean that the, those, those principles are temporary? And they aren't, no, those principles have survived and they've migrated into the bylaws. And so they, those have got stronger. What we've done away with is the vehicle that we mm -hmm. use to carry them there. So I think that's very important that we've used this process. You, you, you're saying the embodiment of those in the bylaws actually actually is more reinforcement it, than it, standalone it, in the AOC. It, they're now in a much stronger place than than the AOC. The AOC was still a contract. Now they're in the in the DNA of, of, of ICANN. So it's going to be much harder to and, and and they should. That's where they should be. These obligations of, of accountability and transparency. And again. They, they can be changed by the community. So I think that's important. And I think the other thing that's important is to say thank you to, um, uh, to Larry Strickling and, and Fiona Alexander. I haven't mentioned Fiona, but she's been there through most of this, providing an enormous amount of cohesiveness to, that, to all of this process. Larry Strickling being the Assistant the Secretary, Secretary of Department of Commerce and Fiona being one of the people on his staff who worked with ICANN. Exactly. And I think... Um, there's a whole lot of reasons why they decided that it was appropriate to do the last pe the last step of this of this process, and we've talked through it. Um, having decided that ICANN was mature enough and was internationally acceptable enough and was internationally strong enough to handle that final transition, um, so I think they deserve a lot of credit for for that. Earlier earlier administrations had had said basically this will never happen, you know, or given the impression that that was the that was the view. Uh, and a lot of people said, you know, the U.S. will never give up its particular relationship to that IANA file. And so I think they need, they, you know, the community owes them a vote of, of uh, thanks and, and an acknowledgement that there were other options, but I think they chose the right one and then they stood by it and they pushed it and they defended it. Peter Dengate Thrush, you were thanking them and I want to thank you for taking the time to talk to us. Uh, very much appreciate it. Thank mm -hmm. you, Peter. Thank you.